you know, we're just very excited for today's program. And to kick it off is Paul Saunier with Joe Madler from Pfizer. Paul. Yeah, thank you, Stan. Uh, excited to be here. Sounds like another amazing program. Um, so great job. Uh, my name is Paul Saunier. Uh, I'm the author of The Fourth Wave Digital Health. Uh, which is the definitive book on digital health. Uh, I define the term digital health as the convergence of the digital and genomic revolutions with health, healthcare, living society. Uh, and it's these companion revolutions that are driving a fourth new era of human progress. I'm also the founder of the almost 90,000 member digital health group on LinkedIn, as Stan pointed out. Uh, I'm an innovation and digital health SME at PA Consulting, where we work across industries, including the health and life sciences, and in particular, we assist pharmaceutical enterprises with their burgeoning innovation efforts aimed at modernizing and digitizing clinical trials to develop digital and combination therapeutics that are truly patient-centric. Uh, so with that, um, we're gonna be speaking of uh, pharma innovation, of course, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Joe Mather, Executive Director and Head of the Advanced Science Group at Pfizer. Uh, Joe and I will be discussing decentralized clinical trials, regulatory concerns and Pfizer's involvement in the, the very new Decentralized Trials and Research Alliance, which was a new one to me until recently. Um, but before we jump into that, Joe, uh, great to meet you. Um, would you mind telling us a bit about your professional background and focus at Pfizer? And if you like, maybe some of your personal background as well. Well, uh, hi, uh, nice to meet you, Paul, in person finally or virtually, and uh, thank you for the invitation to talk today. Um, so my career at Pfizer started in the early 90s as a bench scientist. I was focused on neuropharmacology and channel physiology. Uh, that's what really brought me to the company uh, to help work on some of the early uh, receptor-based studies that we're doing in neuroscience and also in immunology. But really, I'm a molecular pharmacologist um, as well because we were all three in protein structure to understand the physiology and function. So biophysics is really my background. Um, I've been here for 25 years total, but I had to have a, a break in between to do uh, some work with AstraZeneca as their innovation neuroscience innovation group spun up in Cambridge, US. Um, and after that time, I came back to the neuroscience group and then on into precision and quantitative medicine to help with more translational aspects as I moved uh, into clinical research. And so our group at Pfizer and the digital medicine group and translation imaging group were really uh, quantitative uh, scientists focused on transformation of data and, sen and sensor input. And so we're looking across the portfolio of where we can enable either uh, novel endpoint development or uh, scale and patient secretricity in our clinical studies. And so with that focus, we're fundamentally uh, touching all aspects of our portfolio and therapeutic advancement product. Well, oh, fantastic. Um, so let's jump right into some questions here for, uh, for our audience to learn more about what you do and, and your thoughts. Um, given the complexity of drug supply and shipment, decentralization seems at first glance unfeasible. Um, so I'm curious how sites and sponsors are handling direct to patient trial uh, medications. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, when you think about flexible or decentralized trials, uh, the concept really is a risk-based assessment based on the strategy protocol and needs. However, when it comes to drug shipments, um, primarily the, the situation that's kind of developed over the last year during the pandemic is either a site pharmacy or central pharmacy shipping directly to participant or to a site and the site then ships to the participant or lastly, uh, the pharmacy directly ships to the participant uh, and, or a telehealth provider comes to this individual in a situation. So there are alternatives and, and situations depending on the needs of the patient and the study protocol, but there are three different levels of, of, of engagement and with regards to clinical supply and drug supply and, and clinical studies at scale in a decentralized model. And it really is depending on how much risk and what the study requires. Mm, very interesting. Uh, so in, in light of a recent survey conducted by Oracle, uh, indicating that 76% of researchers are now running decentralized trials because of the pandemic. Uh, what impact have decentralized clinical trials had at Pfizer? Oh, well, fundamentally, I think the biggest example of what decentralization has led to and the impact of the concept of decentralized trials is information management. And really the biggest impact on that is how data flows from the individual into our clinical databases reporting. 
if you think about it from a vaccine development perspective, which is probably the most impactful area that we've had in the decentralization and information management space, real-time data with regards to adverse events and efficacy were being reviewed on a 24-hour basis throughout the clinical development plan as study results were coming in. And that information flow was automated in the concept of decentralization so that sites were actually able, or health records were actually being trended real-time into Pfizer databases for analysis to be reported by secondary boards of review for safety and also efficacy so that when the time the patient numbers were high enough, the vaccine development group had the information at hand and could directly discuss with the FDA the, the findings both on the safety and the efficacy of the, uh, uh, the vaccine. And that leads to an ultimate a discussion around the original emergency youth authorization um, data set. And so that's probably the most mass impactful, but across the portfolio, all of the different aspects of, of trial design, whether it was at home uh, telehealth visits or healthcare providers directly going to a participant's site or uh, uh, calls from the site to individuals to get screening data, things that were always done at a clinical site were used to essentially unload the burden of a clinical trial participant and the risk of that involved in coming to the site and in, in the exposure. And so those practices and learnings are essentially being integrated across our portfolio as we go into full development to make the burden lighter on the site as well as just in the clinical study. Oh, very interesting. Uh, so in light of the pandemic, uh, it was timely uh, that the Decentralized Trials and Research Alliance was launched just in December of last year. Uh, it has an impressive list of organizations, obviously including, including Pfizer, uh, more than 100 member organizations spanning life sciences research companies, patient advocacy organizations, technology and service providers, and leading regulatory authorities uh, such as the FDA. Um, so can you tell us more about how the DTRA is working to further policies and innovation in decentralized trials? Well, I think first and foremost, they come from a, 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 an experience and knowledge base. So one of the founders, Craig Lipset, was a former Pfizer employee working in GPD and was actually one of the first folks within Pfizer that had come up with a decentralized trial and ran that in, uh, in, in early 2016, 2017. So that kind of research experience and development organization concept was early on in our practices and he's taken that out and kind of populated the space in that area. I think the concepts around decentralization are the barriers to regulatory and local health authorities that have kind of shown where the gaps are in decentralized trials. You know, medical licensure, uh, safety reporting uh, from infection, right? So direct reports of vaccine tests or PCR tests with regards to viral loads. Those health reporting authorities need that information in a 24 hour period. That means you have to have automation and information flow to those. So those types of barriers, regulatory barriers that are kind of developed in the US with regards to medical licenses, oversight, adverse event monitoring or, or, uh, or, or, or lab tests those types of the things that decentralized trial analysis are trying to get best practices coalesced around so that the discussions with the regulatory or agencies can actually happen. The same thing is essentially needing to happen on the, the rest of the world solution, right? And in that case, Pfizer and our organizations are contributing to an IMI initiative called Clinical Trials at Home. And those discussions are essentially best practices in data privacy, security, and remote patient monitoring on the EU side. So Pfizer is working on both sides of this equation to influence the external regulatory environment to coalesce around best practices and drive the, 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 the best practices across the industry. Mm, very interesting. Um, so sort of a related question, uh, Joe, in your view, uh, while it's great to see that the FDA is working with the DTRA, and as we know, they've also got the Digital Health Center of Excellence. So they're doing a lot in digital health, which is fantastic. How do you feel, uh, in addition to that, the agency has evolved to address this new normal of decentralized trials? Well, I think you know, the, the critical aspects that they've kind of, uh, is, is how they've kind of enabled the emergency youth authorization with regards to testing, uh, kits, and other uh, monitoring devices, right? So critical aspects around how, like heart rate uh, activity, uh, temperature, things that you would need in the pandemic to monitor patients with COVID system remotely to not overburden the healthcare system. The implementation and, and concepts that are been discussed for a few years were only accelerated through the pandemic. And so for that reason, I think the need is driven a risk-based assessment of what we've been doing and really kind of beginning to foster a new look at the way the industry and uh, the FDA is valuing these types of technologies, right? The question is down the road, how will these be 
impactful on medical practice going forward? And what is the validity of the data we're collecting from these devices and processes? Mm, very interesting. Um, you know, I don't have any further questions for you, Joe. I know we've we uh, kind of burned through uh, this session very quickly. Um, do you have any other thoughts you'd like to share uh, on decentralized clinical trials in general, uh, what you see moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the good examples, and I, I you know, I didn't really kind of discuss some, one of the trials that I'm actually leading is a, a study in for vaccines development. Um, and this ACRA study is a fully decentralized trial using a downloadable mobile app to report your daily symptoms and voice uh, recordings. But the other aspects that we're learning about in the process is assume nothing when it comes to how the patient will behave and the activities that they're doing. We try to do some of these things in pilot studies, but doing something at scale of, of, of thousands of individuals across the United States, those operational and scientific objectives need to kind of coalesce. And so I think getting an idea, get out of this pilot phase and trying to do things at scale to get a better understanding of what real world data look like in this decentralized space is gonna be the critical aspect in the next year to kind of come to a solution about what is a risk-based assessment for every clinical trial design with regards to decentralization. Interesting, and, and, and I have another question and hopefully this doesn't, uh, this isn't like a gotcha question, but what about uh, adverse events when we're, when we're doing these trials, you know, what happens when we're pulling in data and we say, oh, well, the FDA says, well, that should be a reportable event when perhaps it's just a normal biometric uh, well, I mean, it depends on how you what, what we're talking about specifically. So the critical thing is having access of the investigator at the site to the participant. That connection, whether it's via the, the telephone or uh, an in-person visit in their home, is critical for that AE monitoring piece. And whether the individual or the device is secure and private and, 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 and establishable, right, is the critical aspect of that. When it comes to device monitoring pieces, that comes back to data flow, data security, and privacy. And those aspects really have to be kind of bulletproof if we're going to use remote or unaided devices to assess uh, AEs. And, and in the course of this, uh, these processes, do you end up having, say, uh, the, the digital endpoints or, or perhaps uh, digital biomarkers that arise just uh, serendipitously? Well, so there was two, there's pragmatic assessments of novel endpoints, and then there's essentially monitoring of te using technologies that are essentially analogous to in-clinic assessments, right? So like temperature, heart rate, mm -hmm. respiration, oximetry, uh, those types of things, we have an established record and a requirement for analogy, right? Between in the, with the 510K approval process. When it comes to interpretation of the data and what the device is actually telling you, that's where the algorithms and the AI come into. And that's the piece that's kind of the novel methodology piece of this. Mm -hmm. That's where, that's the piece that is kind of the unknown unknown right now is what is the <laughs> context of that measure and what is the device telling us and how's the data being interpreted by the algorithm. Right, right, right. Well, fascinating uh, stuff, uh, Joe, thank you very much. Um, you know, I know I threw a bunch of extra questions at you, so I apologize if I caught you off guard. No, it's absolutely, it's a day-to-day -day job. So I'm, I'm used to it. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Uh, and so with that, back to you, Justin, or uh, sorry, Stan. No, no worries. And <clears throat> John, I've got a couple of questions if you can stay on camera. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think obviously the uh, the decentralized clinical trial, you know, given the pandemic and everything, everything everyone's going through, uh, is really leveraging a lot of the technologies that we've seen over and developed over a lot of the last 20 years. Are you seeing a specific remote technology that's working better than a lot of others uh, when you're deploying decentralized clinical trials because it's been used a lot more over the last five years in clinical trials? Well, I think the, the, the simplest, there are two aspects. One is activity monitoring combined with uh, patient report outcomes or EPROs, right? Those two technologies, seem to be giving us the most important information when paired together so you get context as well as dependency right and that aspect is really uh one thing that has kind of kind of come above all else is what what's happening with the patient situation and then also giving some context in an objective way for assessing their behaviors and specifically though which technologies you know, you know because again there's, there's there's been this kind of like uh friction or tension uh, between you know, what's been FDA validated versus what provides a lot more insightful data? Uh, what do you, what, what specific technologies, blood pressure, activity, and you don't have to mention any brands, we don't want to do any marketing here, but uh, what, what specific endpoints are you seeing 
that are uh, are coming through that are validated and other ones that are not validated but highly useful for you all. So, so I think it depends on the use case. So I think the data that we're, I mean, depending on what your impact or concept of interest is, right? So I think from a practice impact on the overall healthcare of our, 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 our country and individuals, I think the data that's coming from uh, continuous glucose monitoring is really probably one of the most impactful going down the road when it comes to healthcare outcomes, right? So modifying people's behavior, teaching them how to use their drugs and how to monitor their glucose in real time is gonna be a game changer down the road from a payer perspective. Now from a, a pharma or sponsor perspective, right? Our technologies and the things that we're trying to understand are where our therapeutic uh, innovations are having an impact. So passive monitoring, uh, remote consent, and, uh, and, uh, and, and therapeutic monitoring uh, or outcomes from symptoms is where we're going to have a, a bigger pay in. And those pieces are still kind of an unknown unknown. I think you know the, 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 the pandemic, I think the two things that were really critical was access to EHR and the data that comes from healthcare records, right? And transmission of that record of an individual does have an adverse event that the team can essentially pull that record into the system. And up until that time, essentially remains opaque to us. That transfer of information gives us a real clear understanding from both the investigator side and the sponsor side, how to adjudicate that adverse event. So information management and EHR is probably the most enduring um, benefit of the pandemic and that transparency, how that information flows between systems is really kind of be the piece that really kind of outshines everything else. That's fantastic. So enduring and also painful. I, I, I can tell. Yeah, I agree. If you've dealt with any epic system, you, you are completely aware of all these issues. Uh oh, the be careful, Joe. You know, so really the standardization piece is really going to be the piece that comes out of this, I think. It is, it is. And, uh, you know, I certainly, you know, I think the, it looks like you have the scars to show for it as well. So I think the, uh, the, 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 the other question that's coming from a couple of other attendees is around social determinants of health and low resource settings. You've certainly you know, been involved with a lot of work that uh, Joris Van Dam has done at Novartis over the last uh, two decades, really, in working with Latin America, Africa, Asia, and trying to find clinical trials, technologies that can deploy in some of the world's poorest 100 countries. Uh, have you seen anything that really is <clears throat> catching on there when it comes to decentralized trials? Because so many of those countries are now just getting some second and third waves of the 617, the P1, the 484 virus strains, and they're shutting down. They're in lockdowns right now. And so clinical trials, you know, where we were kind of March, April, May last year are really being shut down. Decentralization is more important than ever. What are you seeing there? I've seen some interesting use cases. I haven't seen scale yet, but I think really the iPhone or your mobile phone is probably the most useful piece of information. One allows you to report symptoms remotely. And the other is aspects of the information you can get from the camera, whether it's oxygenation of your blood tissue at your fingertip, those types of algorithms and also, you know, cardioballistic signal monitoring from the facial camera, right? So there are two aspects that the phone and every individual in a third world country effectively, there's high pen higher penetration of mobile technologies. There's primarily your maybe minor, your major information source. So that type of information as well as for population monitoring for infection rates and also for symptom detection might be the best use case. The question is, do the healthcare provider networks have access to the information coming off the devices through the apps in a way that is going to make it scalable? And that's really the next impediment we have in this space. It is. And a lot of the decentralized trials are providing smartphones to their patients. Are you seeing that as well in, in some of these low resource countries? We are. And, and the, the real challenge is, you know, is that they're closed systems, right? And they're not up to individuals uh, own personal devices. So we are getting better about BYOD. And that's a challenge that all folks are dealing with in the pharma space, but that is becoming more common. Uh, this, the question is, how do you implement those uh, those BYOD type solutions at scale um, that are manageable across all you know mobile platforms and system levels, right? So you kind of always are forced to deal with the lowest common denominator if you use the individual's device, but if you provide devices, it's always cost and scale. Yeah, and, and actually, I'm working on a grant right now with a BYOD universal system. Uh, we're just we're just testing it and seeing if it works or not. Again, anyone who has an interest in learning more about that, definitely contact me either through LinkedIn or the chat box here, but uh, tremendous. And um, you know, I think when you see the future of, of decentralized trials, and obviously there's everyone now from Amazon to Apple to you know, Microsoft and, and Google getting into the personal device market, uh, what, wh where do you see this going in five years? Are we gonna continue to see this rampant, uh, you know, again, expedited use authorization from the FDA. Are we going to see this this massive shift, really revolutionary, going from single digits to mid double digits in adoption for decentralized technologies and clinical trials? 
Are you seeing that continuing? Or are you gonna stay at slow down and maybe even dip back like we saw telemedicine from like March of 2020 to now? Let me, you know, Kelsey might respond in, in some ways. I, I think the simple answer is it depends on where the money goes, right? Because if, if the payers and the medical professionals can handle the information coming from the systems, then the dollars, dollars will support further stabilization. If the payers or the, the medical professionals don't get paid for service done remotely or through medical uh, devices, then it's going to be a question of where the balance is between us, because there's always a risk associated with technologies and disruption and connection. And so I think in some ways it's going to depend on how well we come to terms on how these things are going to be paid for. I, I do really, I'm really kind of concerned on the overload of our healthcare net, uh, providers uh, with information and contact of individuals. But at the same time, if the, the, the physicians and the clinics are actually going to get paid for their services the same way they do in clinic sites, then everything probably will continue to be status quo. I think in the next phase, I think it's going to really be depending on how, how uh, these are going to be paid for going forward. Great. Well, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Joe, both. Really appreciate your time. We know how busy you guys are. So again, uh, and, and just tremendous work, uh, of both of what you're doing, Paul, and leading the digital health thought, uh, just in, in, in evangelism there. And then, uh, Joe, your good work in leading data science and health science within Pfizer. Thank you both. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Paul.